Welcome to Podcasting Smarter, the podcast for podcasters by podcasters. Podcasting Smarter is the official podcast from Podbean, featuring podcasting interviews, best practices, and helpful tips. We're here to give you the tools, resources, product updates, and news to help you get started podcasting and keep your podcast growing. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to our May Podbean Podcasting Smarter Storytelling Podcast Week live event. We are so excited today. We are joined by Tracy Wenmeng. Tracy, hello. How's it going? Hi, it's going great. We are so excited to speak with you today and to to jump in and to speak about the journey of the Vietnamese Boat People podcast. It's just such a special, incredible podcast hosted here with us at Podbean. So I'm going to read our brief intro and then we'll jump into it and speak all about the show. Welcome back, everyone, to Podbean Storytelling Podcast Week and Podcasting Smarter Live Series. This is our live event for May, Journey of Hope, the story of Vietnamese boat people, featuring Tracy Win Mang of the Vietnamese Boat People Podcast and Nonprofit. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, Storytelling Podcast Week has live stream sessions like this one with top podcasters and storytellers from scripted fiction and nonfiction podcasts from across our world and our imaginations. We also have exclusive recorded episodes on the Storytelling Podcast Week and Podcasting Smarter Podcast. We are brought to you by Podbean. We're a podcast hosting and monetizing platform and home to over 640,000 podcasts. To start your podcast, head over to podbean.com today. And now we'll jump in. Hello, Tracy. How's it going? It's going great. Thank you so much for having me. We're so excited to speak with you today. So let's jump in and get started. Um, first of all, I want to talk about the inspiration behind the podcast because it's such a unique show. And we'll talk about why in a little bit. But what inspired you to create and to to make Vietnamese boat people? Yeah, I a couple years ago, I was in a personal journey of trying to understand my family's story. And it really just started with like, you know, my parents aging, and then I had my own kids. And I felt that this kind of window of opportunity for me to be able to share, you know, my parents' journey with my kids was closing because of how old my parents were. So I started to go down a path of learning more about my own history of how we came to America and what life was like in Vietnam. And in that journey, I started reading so many books. Um, But at that time, there weren't and this is 2018. At that time, there weren't a lot of books around um, just the Vietnamese diasporic community. There were a couple of memoirs that were already published. And so then I started diving into the oral histories projects that had been done with uh, Vietnamese refugees. And um, if anyone has ever explored those, they are wonderful archives, but they're very long. And they're very hard to find. Um, And it almost felt like when I was doing the research, I would come up with hundreds of records, but then I had to navigate which ones I'd want to listen to. And then it felt almost out of context sometimes, the conversations um, in those oral history projects without knowing all the history behind it, just jumping into a conversation in oral history. I just felt a little bit disconnected Um, and it felt a little clinical for me. Um, So that's when I started to come up with the idea of, you know, there has to be a better way to learn about this part of history. Um, There has to be a way for people like me to find it and really just be able to explore it on my own without needing a lot of um, help and research and, and finding this information. And then I just thought, well, if I'm having trouble, imagine anybody else who, you know, wants to learn this, um, you know, it would be very difficult because they don't have the time and the focus. And I've poured so much time in trying to do this research. Yeah, absolutely. And the show really, in such a beautiful way, documents the, the stories and the journeys of Vietnamese refugees that entered the diaspora, right? And, and I think, you know, it's something where there's an entire generational shift and generational story to be told there in so many different ways through so many different voices. And and that's really what the podcast does. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, when I started um, my own journey, I had no idea I was going to do a podcast. I mean, this was more of like, I have to do it for me. I have yeah. to do it for my children. I just turned 40 at, you know, in 2018, around that time. And my dad turned 80 and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know how many years my dad's going to have left. Like, I don't know anything about my dad's life. You know, he and I just didn't have that type of relationship. So I never felt comfortable asking about his past. Um, I definitely never felt comfortable asking about anything personal, right? It was very much a, I would say a traditional Vietnamese parent-child relationship. Yeah. And so I thought, you know, what do I have to lose? Like, I'm just going to say, hey, can I interview you? Because look at my children, they're so young. And like, I would love to be able to pass our stories on to them, but I don't feel like I have any real knowledge of our story to pass it on. Um, so the easiest thing for me to do was to just buy a microphone and record them. And because I had done so many oral history studies in terms of just trying to find out what's out there, yeah. I was able to come up with a set of questions um, that I wanted to dig into. But to be honest, like it, it became very conversational. I had a couple starter questions, but as soon as you ask somebody one or two questions, as you know, it pulled a thread. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It goes uh, off in all sorts of directions. And it was beautiful to be able to do that with my dad um, and my mom and then four of my brothers who are a lot older than me and also have a very, um, you know, male tendencies in terms of like their Vietnamese culture where they just don't show vulnerability. They don't talk about painful, you know, stories from the past. And so growing up, none of that was shared in our family. Um, so for me, it felt important to be able to start unraveling some of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think it's something where, you know, the purpose is is so clear, right? Of being able to connect intergenerationally to tell these stories within your own family. And we'll talk about later how, you know, that really created the impetus for so many other people to be able to connect with their family and tell their stories and to strengthen that intergenerational link. But first, I want to talk about how the show is made because it's it's really beautifully produced and you make it yourself. What have you discovered through the power of storytelling? And, you know, I, I'd like to also hear a little bit from your side about the production side of it because it's it's really beautiful. It's a beautiful show. Oh, thank you so much. It's really grown and evolved and it's been a very organic process. So when I produced the first season, which was about five episodes, and that was based on my family because I had done all those mm -hmm. interviews and I thought, oh, okay, should I write a book? Well, I'm not a writer, <laughs> <laughs> but I am a podcast lover. So I thought, you know, I have all this audio recording, like, I should just produce a short series of my family stories. Um, and because I'd never embarked on podcasting before, I just had been an avid listener. I'd never been a producer. Um, the first few episodes are very like micro episodes. They were like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But the way I went about approaching it was um, I took it at a very personal level. So the first episode was, it's called Prelude, and it's literally me talking about why I'm doing this, why I feel compelled, um, why it gives me a sense of purpose, um, you know, to be able to understand this part of my past that I had been ashamed of for a very long time growing up as a Vietnamese refugee in America, right? So a lot of it was for my own reconciliation with things that I've kind of shoved um, under the rug you know, growing up. Yeah. Um, but I took the approach of, I'm going to make this very personal. So after that first episode, then the following episodes was me taking the listener through understanding my family story by interviewing each one of them one by one. So then it became a combination of me sharing with the, the listener how I was trying to understand this. And then it would jump to like my brother telling the story. And then it would jump to my dad telling that same story, but then you get his perspective. So one episode, the, the early on episode, it's called um, Riches to Rags. And it's about my oldest brother, who was 16 at the time of the fall of Saigon. 
And a couple years later, in 79, he escaped Vietnam with my dad by boat. Well, they mm-hmm. both shared the same story with me of that very day that they left and what it was like to be out at sea together. For 29 days, I had wow. no idea they were out at sea for 29 days. Wow. Um, and I interviewed them separately and their stories happened to match up. So when I went back and I listened to it, I was like, this is amazing. They're basically telling of, you know, a very similar story, which I, I think oftentimes that doesn't happen because oral histories are very based on memory. So sometimes the facts don't always match up, but the general story matches up. But it was so vivid how their facts had matched up. And so then I started inserting, going back and forth, having each one tell the story. Yeah, um, weaving it together. It, yeah. Yes, and weaving it together. And then um, there was a moment in my dad's story that talks about boat pushback, which means he landed at uh, neighboring countries. Yeah. Um, but at that time, a lot of countries like Malaysia and the Philippines and Thailand and Indonesia, they were exhausted by the volume of refugees that were arriving. So they would yeah. push you back to international waters. Well, then I started to do research and I found some audio and news clippings on international ambassadors talking about the the state of the boat pushbacks and how detrimental yeah. that was to the refugees. And so I did little clips of those to play in And then I would then incorporate what was going on in that part of history. And it all seemed to work because I think for the listener who doesn't understand this part of history, you do have to give them some context of, you know, what somebody is talking about. And because after that first season, very organically, people were reaching out and they said, oh, my God, this is like amazing. Like yeah. the way you tell the story and they were like, I was on the edge of my seat, you know, wondering if your dad and brother were going to make it. It just became a format that worked and that felt different, um, but also felt very intimate and personal, like as if you were in the room, you know, and my dad was telling you this story as a listener because it, it just... It, the, the kind of like the way they told the story just felt so um, close and intimate. Yeah. Um, so that really defined our format going forward. Um, so after that, I had decided that um, when I did interviews with people, and I don't know if I'm rushing through, but after that first season, let me backtrack. After that first season, I put it out there. I said, I don't know if anyone's going to listen to this, but hey, guys, here's my journey. I wrote a couple blogs on my website to go with that series. Mm-hmm. And I started an Instagram account. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when we started getting all these people saying, oh, my God, finally, there's there's something out there that talks about our story. Or somebody would say, listening to your dad felt like I was listening to my dad. Like it sounded, you know, very similar and just his, the, his voice and the way that you were speaking with him, like I could totally relate. And then I got a lot of heartfelt emails and posts that were about how you know, people wanted to do this themselves or people wanted to better understand this yeah. part of history, but they didn't know how. And that's when I decided to branch um, further with the podcast. And I said, you know what? I'm going to start sharing other people's stories because clearly there's hundreds of thousands of people out there who'd gone through this journey. And there are people responding to me that saying that they want to learn more, that they have family members that they w- would like to learn about. Um, so I decided to then turn the nonprofit, uh, the podcast into a nonprofit. And then I had an open call and I said, hey, if you want to share your story, contact me. I, I can help you share it. Um, and you know how many people volunteered? A lot, probably. <laughs> Zero. Oh, no. <laughs> zero so I started just contacting people so the first few I started to reach out to and then my first one was Meredith Kennedy I think she was episode seven or something I had done a lot of research from the Singapore refugee camp which is where I was from or which was where you know my temporary uh, housing was before we arrived to America and um I contacted her on Facebook 
And I said, you know, I I noticed on your Facebook that you had all these pictures from Singapore refugee camp and that you posted all this stuff that you used to be a volunteer there. And I said, you know, my mom and I escaped Vietnam and we landed at the refugee camp. Would you mind sharing your experience? And so she did. I interviewed her and um, she had an extraordinary story about her time at the refugee camp for three years. Um, And it's called The Sound of Freedom because she talks a lot about one refugee um, that she got very close to and he was deaf and she helped him get a hearing aid. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I released her episode, Leo Larson contacted me who had rescued um, refugee boats when he was 26 out at sea. So then he shared his story and then I had other people reach out and then it started just trickling. Once people heard that there were stories beyond my family, um, they started to get more comfortable. And so now we definitely get a lot more people contacting us. Um, And through the nonprofit, we have different ways for them to share the stories. Um, And we encourage it. We provide tools and empowerment kits so that they can go down the journey themselves. Um, Yeah. We're going to talk about that. I was going to say, we're going to talk about that a little bit later because I really want to dive into how you've, you know, created community and tools and really resources within the community. But first, I'd love to share the trailer of the podcast. So we're going to do that now. um, And we have it here for you. So here is just a little, just a little snack of Vietnamese boat people. My name is Tracy Nguyen Meng, and I was a refugee. I was born Nguyen Quang Trung An in Nha Trang, Vietnam, a post-war baby. My family risked our lives to flee Vietnam by boat in search for a better life. But we were not alone. There were millions. We say, get to the ship. Don't look back. Don't look for mom. Don't look for dad. Don't look for anybody. From the rain and tidal waves, the boat was filling up with water, and she was afraid they wouldn't make it. The ocean is very loud. On the seventh day, there's a big storm. Everyone's panicking. And uh, it was probably one of the saddest points in my life there, the family being split apart at that moment. They kept saying, you don't know half the story. Like, you don't know the real story. And I was like, well, then tell me. And they're like, we can't. You would fall out of your chair. And I remember walking into fourth grade in Montgomery, Alabama, the first day, and they stared at me and I stared at them. And I just realized, oh, it's going to be bad. (laughs) And it was until I got my voice back, until I learned enough English to yell back at them. It was all about assimilation. I remember just like having friends over in our our house and I was just making sure that our house doesn't smell a certain way, that it doesn't smell like Nuk Mam. Oh, Mam Rook. (laughs) Mam Rook or or anything of that sort. I think every Vietnamese American would agree when I say that living in the States means navigating two very different worlds. Join me in documenting the stories of hope survival and resilience of the Vietnamese diaspora. Search for Vietnamese Boat People on your favorite podcast app or visit our website at vietnameseboatpeople.org. Oh, such a great trailer, Tracy. And I think you really get a feel for the show as well, which is incredible. Um, And I want to kind of talk a little bit about the ethos of the podcast because it's quite unique and special. So, um, you know, also the idea that we're responsible for our family stories is powerful. And it, you know, you really tapped into that ethos, not just within your own family, but within, you know, the Vietnamese diaspora as well, which is incredible. So, I, I mean, I guess I want to ask you next, how have you seen the work you're doing with Vietnamese boat people and the podcast? Have, have you seen it help others who want to learn more about what may feel taboo with their families, or maybe they don't have the time or even the permission um, or even just the context within those relationships to, to dive into their, their family's experiences. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I definitely think um, telling people that they, 
they should feel that they have permission to ask the questions was a big thing. Um, because I think, again, within our culture, at least for me and a lot of people that I know within our community, yeah. um, it can be a very reserved culture where open communications is not the norm among, you know, family relationships, especially when it comes to parent and child. So as a child, we don't feel like we have permission to dig into, you know, areas where our parents don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it, sometimes we, we're told that it's um, none of our business or it's disrespectful. Yeah. Um, so for those reasons, you know, it can be very intimidating. And what I think I've, I've seen is um, a lot of people have reached out to me in the earlier days feeling like um, they could connect to their parents better just by listening to other people's parents share their story. So that was the first step. So even if they didn't feel like they could approach their parents, at least they felt like they were starting to better understand their yeah. own parents and their history by listening to other people who had gone through similar journeys. And I think that's important because I think with anything, right, you don't have to be a participant, but if you have the resources that um, helps you connect or open your mind, that's like a start. Um, so that's one way that I've seen it really help people is just to be able to like listen to other people's stories and know that they weren't you know, they're not alone, that yeah. their family isn't like unusual, um, that, you know, and then also because it's on a podcast, I think that's the difference between an oral history project and a podcast. Once you put it on um, a vehicle that is so accessible and distributed so widely, all of a sudden you're making these topics everyday conversation or at least more accepted as part of the conversation. You know, when it's an oral history project, it has to be a specific reason why somebody goes to look for that story. But when you're pushing it out on a podcast, and um, I didn't answer this question earlier very well, but our format is that we have curated stories um, that are aligned around seasonal themes, but each episode is designed to be a standalone. So I want people to feel like they don't have to listen to a series. They can yeah, you just don't have to start at episode one, right? right. Season one. <laughs> they can pick and choose whatever they, wherever they want to start. Yeah. And absolutely. that episode is revolved around one story. Um, and then we do try to stick to 30 minutes or less with a very engaging, powerful story in every 30 minutes, because I want people to know that you know, they don't have to have so much time commitment yeah. to be able to to understand these stories. Um, but I think the other thing I would say is because it's so accessible and mainstream, I've had a lot of listeners reach out to me and say, hey, my dad and I took a road trip to see my brother and I played your podcast during that two hour road trip. And wow. she said, you know, when we arrived at my brother's, we started talking about my dad's story and she was like, I really want to tell you that for him to be able to hear other people talk about it, it made him more comfortable to start sharing. Yeah. And so that was something that I didn't expect, but you know, I think a lot of um, people have then been sharing this with their family members and hoping then their family members would want to come forward and, and, you know, open up a little bit more. Um, but yeah, we have other toolkits and we do um, events, both virtual and in person. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's intended to create spaces where people can just connect, even if, again, they're not sharing. Yeah. Just, being, I think people feel like they are um, they can relate to the Absolutely. Community. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things about podcasting that's so special, right? It's, it is an open medium as creators. You don't need, you know, a television executive to give you the stamp of approval, right? If you have a story and you want to tell it, you can, and you can share it with the world. And I think Vietnamese Boat People does that so beautifully, not only in the way the podcast is produced, which I want to get into a little bit more, but also in the way that, you know, feeling that you are represent that you're represented right and feeling that your story um you know you're hearing your story or you're hearing people that you feel you belong with right in in some way or that you feel a way that you resonate right so maybe if culturally right there's a taboo topic or even a, an entire generational 
trauma in a way, right? Yeah. You know, I think it's something where if if that feels secret or shameful or taboo, when you're bringing permission and awareness and openness in a kind way, in an accessible way, and you're saying, hey, this is my family's story. And also, if your family has a similar story, I want to hear about it. You're welcome here. You have a place here, which I think is is so incredible as well. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, a lot of the topics we've really evolved in yeah. um, the last few years because we did start out kind of like a form of oral history, right? But it, in a very, like, I, I would say storytelling format. Yeah. Um, but how we have evolved is that we still collect those oral histories. But a lot of our more recent shows, we talk about, you know, things that are taboo, not just in the Vietnamese culture, but just, you know, in all cultures, we talk about mental health. We yeah. talk about um, you know, domestic violence. We talk about sexual abuse in some of these households, like people coming forward and sharing about it now because they couldn't share it back then because they saw their parents struggle as, you know, refugees trying to survive in a new country. And so that was added weight on top of the sexual abuse that they were experiencing as a child. Um, we talk about, you know, the transgender experience and we have a lot of episodes yeah. that are focused on the LGBTQ community and like what that is like in, in the Vietnamese household, Yeah, you know, and, and we had one story that it was a beautiful story of like his parents really accepting him. And then another one where like it took some time. Yeah. Um, so we, we really evolved to talk about what I say, marrying the past and the present so we still collect these oral histories, but um, the way that we try to tell them in, you know, the more recent episodes is how do, how do we connect with the past um, and how it's affecting our present day um, and our relationship with our family members present day. Um, and then all the other added, you know, new issues that we have to, you know, grapple with in present day. And so there's yeah. a lot of that going on too. So it's definitely evolved. Absolutely. And I think, you know, as podcasters, right, your journey is going to evolve as well. You know, what you're comfortable with in terms of your production style. And that's kind of what I want to ask you next, because you were selected as part of the Google Podcast Creator Program and PRX Podcast Garage, which is a huge deal. <laughs> you know, it's definitely one of those things where you, there's a lot of resources and community and and funding there. Um, and so I want to ask what that experience was like, but overall, you know, kind of how your production style and approach to the podcast as a podcaster has evolved through the seasons of the show? Yeah. Well, so the first few seasons, um, it was a very lonely job. <laughs> yeah. As most podcasters out there know what I'm talking about. It can be a lonely sport. Um, yeah. So I did all the interviewing. Um, I, you know, I did all the scripting, the cutting, the the soundtracks. Um, and then slowly as I got volunteers in, um, they would do the cutting. So like, you know, I transcribe it and then I mark it. It's always easier to know what you don't want in. And so you kind of do that. And then that's how the process works is um, I'll replay an interview and I'll listen to everything. And it's very easy the first pass to say, okay, we don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need that. Um, and then the second and third pass is usually, um, okay, that's the, that's the nugget of their story. Like let's, that's the arc of it. And then let's go back and um, then just find the pieces that support or lead up to that arc. So then there's more cutting. Um, and then, of course, because I am, I'm pretty um, disciplined on trying to stick to the 30 minute format unless it's um, a live episode, which, you know, conversationally people have seen it. So I don't want to cut too much. I want to share it the way it has, uh, the way it was. Yeah. Um, but that 30 minute helps me because um, it really focuses me on what parts of the conversation that I think is going to be really powerful for the listener and then what parts I can just narrate over to summarize or what parts should I add historical context so that the listener can really understand what this topic is about or what this conversation is about. So like, I think the, the 30 minute format has kind of forced me to create a script that is tight. 
at least, you know, it could always be tighter. But over time, it's yeah. um, it's helped me a lot. And we are a small team. We're um, a team of four on the podcast specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, and the it's four, including me. And three of them started out as volunteers. Like they, they were on this journey with me unpaid Um, and, you know, now, yeah, amazing. And they never even asked for anything. And so, you know, luckily we have some supporters out there that really believe in the podcast. So like some of us can get paid, (laughs) which is important. Um, But what I, early on when it was the four of us, um, after it was just me, it was the four of us, I would have somebody do some of the cutting and then somebody would do the script and then we'd all meet and go through it. And then what I found was um, because this was all of our side projects, it was actually more streamlined if I just assigned a person per episode. And I think that also allowed the person to really immerse themselves in the story. Yeah, and go deep. Yeah. Yeah, dig deep. Because if you're just cutting based on what someone tells you to cut, it it becomes autopilot, right? You're just following the instructions. But if you're listening through it and you're deciding what to cut with, you know, the the lead producer, which is me, then you're immersing yourself and you're going deep in the story. And then I think then you start to create a script that really connects it and makes sense. And so for me, actually, I found that that was a better fit than to do um, parts, you know, bits and pieces per episode with the four of us. Um, and I think for them, it's been great because then they feel ownership of an episode. And now they yeah. have a portfolio of episodes in which they were like kind of senior producers on it with me. And so um, that's that's our process now. And we, you know, I would like to be more, um, I would like to drop episodes more frequently Um, we do about three to four weeks in between and it's just, it's a little bit harder. I think one, because our format doesn't allow us to whip it out as quickly. Um, Yeah. It's definitely like a heavily produced show. Yeah. Right. Right. And normally shows like ours are, you know, they go on a break and they produce and then they like launch. They'll do one a week for 12 weeks or. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And, um, or, or they'll like not produce at all for six to eight months. They'll do their entire, you know, six piece series and then they'll drop it every two weeks. Um, we, on the other hand, are slower, but I have found that it doesn't bother our listeners, actually. Um, and I think what's really interesting is I think the majority of our listeners actually weren't like they didn't find us through the podcast. They found us through Instagram and through yeah. word of mouth and stuff and then became podcast listeners. And so I don't feel like they are expecting me to drop an episode every week. Um, I think they are they seem to be patiently waiting for the next one and loyally listening to it. And so yeah. I'm very, um, you know, I'm very like grateful for that. Um, but the PRX Google was an amazing experience. I don't know if you wanted me to jump in that, but it taught me a lot of yeah. things that I think I, I knew, but I never I never made the time or apply. Yeah. Yeah. To like really focus on it because we were so much like um, we were producing as we go. I mean, it was very much like, okay, this is a, this is a great interview we just did. Let's, let's, you know, put it out, get it out there. Yeah. 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 And then, um, but when I joined the PRX um, Google Podcast Creators Program, it was the first year that they, because of COVID, they began yeah. doing it virtually. They used to fly people in and it would be like an intense week together. Instead, we had it drawn out a couple weeks virtually. Um, I think I was also um, one of the few podcasts that had already been producing. Some of them had either just started to produce a few episodes or they were they had a concept that they were then trying to um, get some training on producing the first few. So I was a a leg up there, but what it really taught me was um, just being around other people who were trying to to figure this out and really strengthen their concept was extremely helpful because for me, it was such an organic experience Mm -hmm. that it made me sit back and think about how everyone was positioning their concept 
um, and why it was important to tell these stories and why it was important for their listeners. Like I had all the pieces there, but I wasn't, I wasn't packaging it that way. Right. Mm. It just kind of organically spoke to some people that way. And that trailer that you played that came out of the PRX Google program, because one of our things was, Hey, like you got, everybody has to create a trailer of what your show is about. And it has to be able to like in that short two minutes or less, be able to, um, you know, give the listener a sense of what they can expect when they listen to your show. Um, and so that was something that came out of that program. And that I had a trailer before that, but it wasn't anything like that. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's such a great tip for any podcast, right? It's something where, you know, to draw people in, to get people excited, to not only hear what your show is about, but the tone and the emotion and, you know, to kind of take them on a shorter version of that ride, right, of of your show is so important. Um, yeah, I mean, we could talk about trailers all day, but it's it's a really <laughs> beautiful one. Um, you know, when to release it and all that good stuff. But I think it's it it definitely helps in so many ways. And I mean, especially also if you if you're just launching your show, I'll just I'll just say this in general. A lot of directories, if you're if you're um, if you're distributing your podcast to multiple directories and you haven't launched the show yet, but you want to gain listeners, putting a trailer out is a great way to make mm -hmm. sure that you're on those directories and then have listenership once that first episode even comes out. You'll, you know, the audience is there for you. So trailers are really powerful. Um, and I want to ask you now about your new season because it's out now. And it's called Mame Oi, which translates to Dear Dad, Dear Mom, which focuses on uncovering stories about parents and preserving stories within the Vietnamese diaspora. So you have some incredible contributors to the season, including Lisa Fu, who's an Alaska-based journalist and the creator of Before Me, and Kevin Trong, the creator of My American, which is a, an amazing documentary. Um, so I want to ask for the new season how you approached finding guests, because you work with kind of almost journalists and 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 documentarians. And so how did you approach finding guests for the new season and specific stories for the episodes? Yeah, also very organic. Yeah. Um, so I had met um, all of the, the guests that are coming out in our season. Um, I had met them, gosh, just throughout the years, right? And um, yeah. Some of them I reached out to, some of them reached out to me, and it's because we all share one thing in common. It's we're all trying to tell stories about our parents, and yeah. I did it in season one, and um, Lisa Fu did it last year when she released Before Me with self Evident podcasts, um, and Kevin Jung is doing a documentary where he only released a, a short I forgot what they call it, but it's it's like community feedback short, which is like he's still in production. Yeah. So he hasn't finalized it, but he released a little bit of it so he could get viewer feedback as yeah. he works on the final production. Um, and so he reached out to me because he said, hey, I'm doing this community thing in Philadelphia. I'd love it if you and people that are part of your team, you know, come join me and we could, you know, watch the film, give me feedback, talk about how do we engage the community in being a part of this um, as I, you know, further produce the film. And so that's how I met him. And um, I don't want to, I, I have Caroline Doe, who is a playwright based in New York. Yeah, she incredible. wrote a play called Buried Ruins that we're releasing. Actually, that episode's dropping in two weeks. Um, but I don't even know how I met her, but she invited me to her reading last fall and I just loved it so much. And I said, Carolina, like, how long have you been working on this? And she said, eight years. Wow. She's like, it's been bits and pieces, but I find, she's like, I still have so much more work, but I had the opportunity to do a reading and, you know, to put together a cast an all Vietnamese cast, wow. do a reading yeah. on a New York stage. And I took it. Um, and so I just, then I started, you know, once I had those three in the back of my mind, I started then going after um, other people that I thought, um, you know, could kind of share the same theme. And so that's how the theme came about. It's bad, man. I, and we're trying something new. Um, so, so I have this annual story slam 
which this is one way that we engage the community. We invite people to submit stories, two minutes or less. Um, they get a cash prize. They get featured on our virtual event. They get featured on the podcast. They get tons of gifts from our event sponsors. <laughs> um, so, but usually the story has to align to the seasonal theme. Right. So, you know, the we have an open call for submissions right now. So one of the episodes will be whatever stories come in that we've selected. But another, um, we have a Story Slam alum from last year who um, have their own independent podcast. I think they've only released um, four episodes, maybe. It's called um, Win Siblings. Oh, Growing Up Win. So there's four siblings. And um, when they did my Story Slam last year, they did a Vietnamese poetry about their father who had passed away. Mm. And it was so beautifully written. And they're just, none of them are in the creative field. It's all like a side hustle. But they're truly, <laughs> oh my God, the four of them are so like, they're such wonderful siblings. You can see it in their relationship. Um, and they're such creatives. So I approached them and I said, hey, this is my theme this year. And I know, I think you guys would be great at, you know, producing something about your mom or your dad or both as part of the season. And so they're actually going to be one of the content creators for one of the episodes. Wow. Um, but I wanted to try something new because this theme is really about other people trying to learn more about their parents. And so that's, you know, I just thought they would be perfect and they've already done a little bit of it in last year's story slam. So I wanted to like give them an opportunity to dig further and expand and, upon that. Yes, yeah. and expand that two-minute story that they showcased last yeah. year into a full episode. Um, so they'll be a part of this season. And, I, you know, I think it's good as a podcaster to try something new. I think, you know, with anything, your listeners stay loyal, but they're also changing, right? And they want to see something um, different. They want the show to, you know, kind of grow a little bit too. And so that's what we are trying to do this season. Just, you know, pull in some different factors. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's great to evolve your podcast with what excites you, with what your community is excited about. I think a lot of the time as as podcasters, you know, it's it's easy to get stuck in the format, right? Oh, this is my show. I have yeah. to be I have to be loyal to a format or to, you know, specific guests or, you know, specific aspects of production. But it's really about what works, what interests you, and it's okay to evolve. And it's actually important to evolve and grow with your show. So I think that that's just such an incredible aspect of it. Um, and, and I want to talk now about the nonprofit because the Story Slam really feeds into that as well. Um, so you've built this incredible nonprofit that is part of Vietnamese boat people. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe the podcast is um, came before the nonprofit. And it really, the, the nonprofit is there to help people tell their family stories and strengthen the link within families and between generations. So tell us about the nonprofit aspect of it, how it got started as an extension of the podcast, and then some of the resources that you have, because I mean, the journey map is so cool. And you have all these community events, like the Story Slam, that also feed into the overall podcast. So it's all very integrative. Yeah, I mean, I wanted, you know, the podcast for me was just a vehicle into like um, sharing these stories and making them more mainstream. But because of the feedback I was getting, I felt like other people were going through the same journey. Yeah. And um, I just wanted, I, I didn't really see a space out there that was collectively telling our story. Um, and what I mean by that is, First of all, there's so many more books out there by Vietnamese diaspora authors talking about the Vietnamese diaspora community, right? And that's so exciting because that never that was not there when I was growing up. And had it been there, I don't know, maybe I wouldn't have been so conflicted with my own identity. And I so I love that part of it. Um, but I think, you know, what I find is that when you read a book like whether it's a memoir or a historical fiction, you connect to the book, but you don't necessarily connect to a community. Um, and so I think the podcast is the same way. 
Like when you listen to the podcast and you listen to these stories, you feel connected to them because they're similar to yours. But then when you yeah. shut it off, what do you do then? Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to create um, spaces and format and, and stuff, things that people could then to after listening show. And so it started off with the blog where um, I didn't want to share their story on the podcast podcast or if they personal creative writing or a journal or some photos that they want to share, they would be able to um, submit it as a blog and we would edit for them and then publish it on our community blog. And to get that going, I had to do, if you're going to be a volunteer at Vietnamese Boat Profit, is you have to get your own personal blog. And I, I volunteers yeah. dig deep. And then after that, we started doing, before COVID hit, we started doing events in New York City, which had a tremendous um, show, people showing up. Yeah, because, response. Yeah. yeah, response. Because, you know, in New York City, we're so multicultural, but we're also so fragmented um, yeah. so that it, it can be really hard to find community. And I think even though New York City has a large Asian American population, the footprint of Vietnamese Americans is actually quite small. So when we started hosting events specifically about Vietnamese American culture, like people showed up. And people were excited about it. And um, and then, of course, COVID happened and we ended up having to do them virtual. But that actually was a good thing for us. Like even the story slam, because then people started reaching out from California, from Texas, which, um, you know, have large Vietnamese American populations. But then we had people from like Minnesota, Kansas City, um, mm. you know, Orleans and Minneapolis, just like places where you don't naturally think there are a lot of Vietnamese people, but they were reaching out because they didn't have a big community where they were. So like they wanted to join our virtual community. Um, and so that was really good. And then the two biggest projects of mine in the, the last two years have been the conversation kit, which we, um, we sell on our website, but we also donate to other nonprofits for them to yeah. use if they're going to have, um, you know, projects or programming that is revolved around preserving family history. But there, there are a deck of cards with, um, questions that you can ask family members yeah. um, about their own experiences uh, and it's in English and in Vietnamese and I worked with some um, scholars within the you know Vietnamese experience and refugee experience um, air area that helped me put together a timeline it's not um, all inclusive but it does map out major historical events that were happening that led up to the mass exodus of refugees fleeing Vietnam. Yeah. And so I think that helps people get a little bit of context when they're like interviewing somebody or having a conversation. It allows them to kind of, you know, conceptualize what was happening in the country at that time during the, you know, with these historical events. Um, yeah. So I created that because I got a lot of listeners saying, hey, do you have any tips for me? Or yeah, like, like, I don't know how to ask these questions or yeah. I don't know what to ask <laughs> or, you know, or I don't know, you know, kind of what the historical kind of um, uh, touchstone moments were. Right. Like, it's definitely something where I think a lot of people, especially with hearing the stories that you're telling and them feeling like, oh, maybe that story is in my family or, oh, right. you know, maybe that. Maybe my mom or dad has that story, but not being able to n know or have the tools to ask or even the right questions. That's so important. Yeah. And we, and you know, when I was getting that early on, I would send them my interview guide and I said, Hey, this feels a little bit clinical, but feel free to use it. Um, and, and I wouldn't use all 10. Like it's a guide. Just pick, pick one or two to start off with. Um, but everybody, like almost everybody just felt like, okay, but I don't know where to begin. Should I sit them down? Do you think I should record? Do you think I should take notes? And so that's when the idea of the cards came about. Because I said, oh, let's create something that doesn't feel like it has to be this massive conversation. No, and it gamifies it a little bit. Oh, right. It's not, right. It's, or it's, put it in, in the middle of the table right. during a family dinner or a party and be like, hey, pick a card. You yeah. know, and, and let's it's start less the, intimidating, the dialogue. I think. Yes. Yeah. 
And so, so that's, it was a digital version at first, which we discovered that um, it's too many pages to print out and parents don't know how to download a PDF file. <laughs> so we ended up creating a physical deck of cards. Um, and so, you know, it's been a project that I've been working on the last few years. And so yeah. I'm so excited that we actually have a deck of cards that, you know, we ship to people when they want to have this dialogue. Um, and, you know, by the end of this year, we're going to produce a journal with it. So oh, that beautiful. when they're having a conversation or people can just jot down as they go. Um, the journeys map is the big, the big project. Yes. Um, the journeys map is incredible. So this is another aspect of the nonprofit yes. and it's, it's a literal map. Let's start yes. there. <laughs> it's a literal map. And um, it's, I mean, there were two main reasons why this was born. The first one was, um, in addition to people saying, I want to interview my parents, I don't know what to ask them. They were coming to me and asking if I could interview them. Oh, and, wow. Okay. <laughs> yes. And um, because the podcast is curated, we don't push out everything we interview. I, I'm sorry, everybody we interview. Like we have an archive of interviews. Yeah. Um, because we also have a collection that we archive at New York University. So we have a partnership with them and they archive all of our work there. Amazing. Um, but I, one, I, I don't have the bandwidth as much as my team and I would love to interview everybody who would like to be interviewed. We, you know, sadly don't have the bandwidth and um, we're going to be doing community events where people can sign up on a day or a weekend and we'll just be doing pop-up recordings. But even those, and you know, you can only capture so yeah. many a day. Yeah. So I wasn't able to do that. But second, I wanted to be like, well, don't wait for me to do it. Like you can do it. Yeah. Like, you know, like don't wait for other people to do it for you. So we created the journeys map um, because we wanted to create a space with some tools and tips, but ultimately to get people to upload their own stories, um, their own interviews yeah. or their own photos of their yeah. family to be part of this greater collection that again, I've seen exists in academia based oral histories, but we've, we've developed a space where, you know, people are coming to us to listen to these stories without needing to do it for a school project, right? They just, it's curiosity and they're not just Vietnamese people. Like it's just people who are truly interested in these types of, you know, human interest stories. And so I wanted to create sort of like that, that collection that is av available beyond the podcast because there's hundreds of thousands of stories out there. Like we're only producing a small fraction of it. Um, but I wanted it to be something where the community can share their stories in their own words um, yeah. and that they have the tools and um, the resources to help them along the way. And then the, the last thing I'll just say is that we have a global audience for the podcast. And so I thought this map idea is is really it because I would love for people to contribute from all over the world. Yes. Because the Vietnamese diaspora is all over the world. People ended up in Australia, in France, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in the UK, and they are listening to the podcast. Um, so the idea was, you know, now we have this space and if you're listening to this and you're, you know, going to go down the journey of recording or preserving or writing, however you want to do it of sharing your family's story, come share it on our journeys map because we want to showcase it. And we want to show just sort of this vast collect collection that, um, you know, yeah. exists all over the world. Yeah. And it's incredible. I mean, you can check out the journey map. We'll have it here in the, in the notes. Well, obviously the, it's on your website. Um, and you can really kind of, you know, look at different physical locations and the stories that are there. Um, and it's just an incredible thing to see and to to know, you know, people are part of and, it, you know, each dot on the map is a story and, and someone's unique journey. It's it's truly incredible. Um, the, the last question I kind of want to ask you is about monetization. Um, because a lot of podcasters out there want to monetize and, you know, maybe are download focused or aren't download focused. And there's a lot of different ways to be able to get support for your podcast. And with the nonprofit and and the way that you've structured Vietnamese boat people, it's really incredible. So tell us about how through, you know, the empowerment of the podcast community, you're also able to support the podcast 
and the work that the nonprofit does, you know, whether it's the conversation kits, um, you'll also do special t-shirt campaigns working with artists who donate their work. So I'd love to hear from you a little bit about kind of what that has looked like. Cause a lot of podcasters out there, you know, are looking for how they can um, support their work, but in ways that feel within the integrity of their community. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. And I think yeah. every <laughs> podcaster knows that like, if you're doing this for the money, right. <laughs> it's no, no, the wrong no. reason. I think, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of podcasters just want to know, you know, how to pay for equipment or all that kind of exactly, stuff. Exactly. Exactly. So definitely our journey was like, we were doing it all for free. I mean, this was just like pure love, pure love. Um, so, you know, we do have the benefit of being a nonprofit and um, that has allowed us to apply for grants. Um, you know, grants are an extremely difficult and time consuming endeavor. Um, but they can be very fruitful, um, especially, you know, for a nonprofit and a podcast like ours. It's like yeah. there is a lot of purpose behind this, you know, what we're trying to do. And um, a lot of, you know, our mission is around the humanity space. It's telling, you know, historical stories. It's telling stories about um, individuals and families and um, experiences. But I think it's it's a universal story. I always call it stories of the human spirit. Because, you know, take away the whole Vietnamese aspect. This is just stories about families trying to survive, trying to rebuild their lives, trying to connect with each other, trying to understand each other. And so we lean on that aspect of it as well when we apply for grants. Um, so we, you know, our nonprofit is in the cultural space. So on yeah. one end of it, it's about preserving history. On the other end of it, it's about really, you know, contributing to our society in trying to create empathy for like, you know, um, different communities and also to try to, you know, create diversified underrepresented stories and make them more accessible. Um, so that is a big part of, of how we get funded for some of these other projects. But most of the funding is more towards the nonprofit programs than it is for the podcast itself. Um, but because we're a nonprofit, you know, a lot there's like um we do uh, we do get support from listeners through donations and when that comes through most of our listeners are supporting the podcast when they donate yeah um and what's great is that we can leverage platforms that don't take a cut of the donation because we are a nonprofit. You know, sometimes when you use Patreon and stuff like that, it can be a lot of work to build membership. And then after you, you know, pay for all the fee, the transaction fees that are involved, right. the podcaster doesn't really get that much at the end. Um, but what I would say is like the biggest thing for any podcast podcaster out there is that I didn't ask for money or anything until I felt like I had worked hard to build a community because I think that's important. It's like people have to feel like they're receiving something valuable yeah. through your show. Right. And so for me, after, you know, building community came first. And then once I felt like we had a community of people who really believed in our mission and our ethos and our values, that's when we became a little bit more like confident in saying, Hey, we have a t-shirt campaign, a hundred percent of, you know, the profits from this campaign is going back to our nonprofit. And by the way, the designer that we asked to create this is Brian Hong. He is a Vietnamese Canadian um, illustrator, and he designed this exclusively for our t-shirt campaign. So it's, it was like a one of a kind for this past Lunar New Year. So you're not going to see that design in other I items, at least not during our campaign. Yeah. Um, and Brian was a listener. That's he contacted me saying how much our show had made a difference wow. um, in his own, you know, understanding and relationship with his parents. Mm. And then I looked him up and he had like all these followers on Instagram. <laughs> and I said, Brian, I'm so honored that like, you know, our show means this much to you. Would you be willing to like design something for us? And we would yeah. run a fundraiser. And he said, absolutely. And so I think, you know, for podcasters out there, you know, think about you know, your mission and who you know, and whether or not, you know, they would be willing to do something similar to support your show. Um, but that has helped us. We've done silent auctions online. 
where um, some of our avid listeners um, have restaurants. We've asked them if they want to donate a gift certificate. Um, they have, you know, small businesses, they're authors, they're uh, painters. And so um, they've reached out to us. And once we discovered, you know, what they did, we asked, you know, we'd love to have you contribute back to the work we do by donating a piece of art that we can put on an online auction to raise money for the work that we do. So that was another thing that we did last year that helped. The conversation kit, you know, I had showed PRX and Google the um, the sort of like, uh, what you call it, the prototype with the graphic prototype. And mm-hmm. I had just given them, you know, a, a short rundown of what it is. And they said, you have to produce this. You have to produce this and sell this because your listeners are going to want something like this. They're already listening to yes. your show. They are yes. already going to figure out how to do this themselves. And now you're going to give them something that they can start off with. And so after I graduated from the program, I like got my act together <laughs> and started like figuring out, okay, how do I take this digital version into print? Um, you know, so that it's tangible that, so that people can use it yeah. when they're with their families. Physically hold it and use the cards. Yes. I think yeah. that, that that's such an important thing. And everything that you're talking about, right? Whether it's the the um, t-shirts or the conversation kit, it's really about when people are loving the podcast, you're engaging with them back. It's not, oh, thank you. You know, it's saying, hey, and you're part of this community, right? So, you know, and you know, can you work with us? I think that that's such an, a a really important aspect of it. So, for podcasters out there, right? Don't feel like that it line. Uh, doesn't enable you to ask, right? If right. you have, if you have community or or you have a, you know, an audience that is engaged with your content, it's okay to say, hey, can we collaborate? Hey, I love your illustrations. Thanks for listening. I really appreciate you reaching out. You know, are you open to collaborating? I think that that's such an important thing, and to keep that door open, I think is yeah is incredible. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think you know, feeling. Uh, Having um, the community feel like they are a part of creating your show is for us has been helpful. So, you know, pulling them in to help create artwork or to become a part of like the, the conversation kit was designed by a volunteer who is part of our community. And then we later hired a designer to take it to print for us. But the original artwork was through a volunteer who was a podcast listener. And so I think that's one thing that I think I've also seen other shows where they will like take phone calls from listeners or like they'll answer questions that listeners have typed in. And I always find myself gravitating to those shows because then it's about, you know, creating something for your listener. Um, and even for me, like with our show, I rarely on our um, on our Instagram do I ever like talk about me as a host. Like we're con- <laughs> it's yeah, very, it's something- no, it is. It's very outward focused, and I think that's yeah, part it's of- very outward focused. We talk a lot about the community. We highlight people doing interesting things. Um, we highlight events, and we you know always are trying to get people to participate. Like submit a blog, use the journeys map, or like hey, tell us if like how the conversation kit's working for you. Tag us, and so it's all about like them, and it's all about like us as a community. And so I think um, for those reasons, it's helped us in terms of figuring out, okay, well, are they, you know, willing to spend money on being a part of this program to support it? And not everybody, no, but certainly there has been um, people who are, you know, they're, they're happy to give us $25 or buy a hundred dollar painting on our silent auction, right? Because they, they want to support us. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Tracy, it's been just such a pleasure to speak with you today. I'm going to read our brief outro and then we'll wrap up. Thank you everyone for joining us for this live stream, our May live event, Journey of Hope, the story of Vietnamese boat people, featuring Tracy Nguyen Mong of the Vietnamese Boat People podcast and nonprofit. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, Storytelling Podcast Week and Podbean's Podcasting Smarter series have live stream sessions like this one with top podcasters and storytellers from scripted fiction and nonfiction podcasts from across our world and our imaginations. We also have exclusive recorded episodes on the Storytelling Podcast Week and Podcasting Smarter podcast. 
If you join late or want to have another listen to this amazing storyteller and event, you can replay this live stream on Podbean's YouTube channel. We are brought to you today by Podbean. We're a podcast hosting and monetizing platform and home to over 640,000 podcasts. To start your podcast, head over to podbean.com today. Thank you so much for joining us and stay tuned for our next event. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this replay of our live event episode. If you have any questions about podcasting and want to get in touch with the Podbean team, reach out to us at podcastingsmarter at podbean.com. Happy podcasting.